who is uh, Brother Anthony, who has been serving as president of the Royal Asian Society since 2011. He's going to speak on the topic of uh, travelers' tales or how the whispers learned about Korea. Korea. Uh, born in Cornwall, UK. I don't. I will not tell you when he was born. <laughs> <laughs> Long enough to go that he knew the first travelers. <laughs> Actually, he was born three years later <laughs> than I was born. Uh, he studied medieval and modern languages at the Queen's College in the Oxford University and joined the community of Heze in France in 1969. For those who do not, who are not familiar with the Teja, I will uh, explain briefly. Teja is the name of a small village uh, in the eastern part of France. Since 1940, it has been home to an ecumenical monastic community of brothers known as the community of the Teja. TJ has become, uh, become well known in recent decades for hosting meetings where young adults from all over the world pray and share together. The community's main concern is to promote reconciliation and trust. Brother Anthony came uh, to Korea for, for the first time in 1980, actually invited by uh, the late Cardinal uh, Suhan Kim, the most uh, respected cardinals in Korea. And he began to teach at Solon University uh, in September 1980. And he has been teaching, he was a professor in the Department of English Language and Literature, teaching medieval and Renaissance English literature and culture. He naturalized as a Korean citizen in 1994 with uh, the Korean name as An Sanjae. Uh, he began translating a modern Korean literature uh, in 1988, beginning with the poems of Kusan uh, and Gon, etc. And he published many books. And he's also an expert on traditional Korean tea. He also published a few books on uh, on Korean teams. He is now a uh, professor emeritus of the Sogang University and he was also honored by the uh, Korean uh, government with the uh, one uh, Order of Merit. Uh, uh, and since January 2011 he has been serving as a uh, President of the Royal Asian Society. So without further ado, let's uh, welcome uh, Brother Anthony. A big round of applause. Yeah. to start at the beginning or before the beginning. Most people know about Marco Polo. What a lot of people don't know is that Marco Polo didn't really write his own story. He seems to have sort of told it to a, a writer of romances that he met, a French Italian, who then uh, sort of made it more interesting. But uh, in what he lost was, of course, a lot of the detail, the actual factual detail. And before Marco Polo, a lot of people think he was the first person ever to come, at least sort of somewhere to, toward China. Actually not. There were others, and the most noted is William of Rubruck. He has various names. And he is Flemish, and he was Franciscan. And in the year when Marco Polo was born, there, in what, 1250, uh, 1254 or so, we don't know, but 1254, uh, this William, uh, arrived over on the Chinese end of the Silk Road, uh, visited the court of the Great Khan, and then he went all the way back to France, 
I'm not sure if he was walking or if he was on bicycle or uh, whatever. He certainly didn't come by Air France. Um, he came back to France, to the King of France, and he wrote a report which is remarkable uh, for its uh, detailed observation of what he saw. And one of the things he saw was some courtiers from a distant land. He doesn't really quite, it's not really clear, but he does say that he saw people uh, from Solanga and Mook and uh, judging from various things, people think that that might be actually uh, delegates from either from up Manchuria, Gogolio area, or even from Korea itself, from Koryo, uh, Korea. Not very sure. Of course, uh, Marco Polo did actually identify a country as being called Koli Kaoli, which is pretty much uh, one of the names that the Chinese gave Korea. But uh, you can't really call these things accounts. Uh, so really, you had to wait till people came across, not by land, which is too difficult and dangerous, but by sea, which is also difficult and dangerous. And of course, it all began with the Portuguese. Um, I'm not sure how much Portuguese history you know. There's a free book at the back um, about Portuguese relations with Korea. You can take one when you're leaving. But uh, already in 1487, that's to say before Columbus sailed west, uh, this Bartholomew Diaz was the first Portuguese to sail right down to the bottom of Africa and find that there was a hole at the bottom that you could then sail east and up and he realized that he was in the Indian Ocean. So that was, he opened, he was the trailblazer, but then he went back and it was later, after Columbus, in 1497, the famous Vasco da Gama really opened the sea route to the east uh, by setting out these four ships and arriving in India <coughs> via uh, what you see, uh, the east coast of Africa. They didn't like sort of leaving the site of land. They preferred to see where they were going. Uh, but anyway, they arrived in India, in Calicut, and <coughs> then a few years later, uh, after 1510, then it, it was established, the Portuguese domination of India was established with considerable violence. It's a rather nasty story, actually. And uh, the Portuguese, I suppose, because of the situation after all, 1492, Columbus year, was the year in which the Jews were finally expelled from Spain and I think also Portugal. Uh, and not only the Jews, there were also the Muslims who had been uh, trouble, and the Portuguese were very hostile uh, to Muslims wherever they found them. Anyway, they settled finally in Goa, on the west coast of India, and that became the Portuguese capital for the whole of the, uh, of the east. But then, 1511, they kept sailing eastward, and they arrived at Malacca, which is now in Malaysia. That was a major trading center, international trading center, where you had Malay, Udavati, Chinese, well, Japanese, Japanese, all these people. Again, nasty stories of massacres of Muslim traders. But then they took control of Malacca, and that was then the center from which they went up toward China and Japan, and also down Indonesia. But, of course, they did not really have any contact with or interest in Korea. But this is how you sort of approach Korea, how you come to the point where people do notice that there is Korea. And then, okay, they reach China, and they arrive there in what we call, or people used to call Canton, Guangzhou, in 1514, and then Ningbo, which is not far from there, 1532, again, very rough game, pillaging, attacking Chinese port cities, enslaving people, making money. And as a result, after a couple of decades, 1545, the, the Chinese turned against Portuguese and pretty well massacred the whole Portuguese community in Ningbo. But finally, uh, China accepted uh, some presence, and that's why, why Macau, opposite Hong Kong, became uh, Portuguese property 
pod on me if you like, until very recently. And actually another base was on the island just close to that, this island of Shangchuan, uh, where uh, St. Francis Xavier died. And so the first three Europeans known to have reached Japan, because records name them, and that was in the year 1543, were three Portuguese traders. Uh, we have their names, Antonio, Antonio, and Francisco. But there is also this famous person, as I'm going to be mentioning a bit later, Fernal Mendes Pinto, who perhaps was with them, who certainly claimed to have been with them. And these Portuguese arrived not on a Portuguese ship, they were on a Chinese ship, probably. And they arrived at the very southernmost island of Kyushu, Tanigashima, and Pinto, in his book, uh, amazingly unknown book, uh, tells that either then or on the second visit, probably then, that during the visit there, they introduced the European handheld gun called usually the Archibus, and the Japanese <coughs> for that gun became the name, was the name of the island, Tanigashima. That's the gun that the Portuguese introduced to Japan. They just gave them one. Somebody there had a spare one. Said, yeah. Would you like this? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, and within a year, apparently, the Japanese swordsmiths and ironsmiths had managed to reproduce the mechanism. And they began mass producing these Portuguese guns. So that toward the end of the 16th century, uh, there were probably more of these guns in Japan than anywhere else in the world, certainly in, even in Europe. And they were the weapons, if you read Sam Hawley's book about the Indian War, I hope everybody has read some of Sam Hawley's book, um, he will tell you, he tells you how those were the guns which were de determining in uh, ensuring the unification of Japan under uh, Hiroshi and Hiroshi. And then those guns, these little hundred, well, not quite, but they were slow actually, but uh, they were then used in the invasion of Korea in the Indian War, and they killed an awfully large number of Koreans, to say nothing of Chinese. And so they represent the first direct impact on Korea, those guns, Western inventions, mediated in Japan. Most famous, I suppose, most famous, one of the very famous Westerners uh, to come then to Japan uh, was Francis Xavier, who with other Jesuits arrived in Japan in 1549. And they hoped then to bring Catholicism. Uh, actually, uh, they arrived because, again, this unknown uh, Mendes Pinto, whose book you can read if you have a little bit of time, big book, uh, he tells how, after a second visit, he was just leaving from Kagoshima when there was a man rushing down the, down the cliffs, or say, save me, save me, save me, the Japanese, who jumped onto the boat and said, they're accusing me of murder, I'm innocent, save me. And so this uh, young man uh, was taken uh, by uh, the Portuguese, back to uh, Malacca, where he became a Christian. He was introduced to uh, Francis Xavier, who uh, then learnt from him a few elements of Japanese, and he went with Francis Xavier back to Japan uh, at the beginning of his mission. So that's Pinto too. And so uh, Francis Xavier spent several years in Japan, then he left again, went back to uh, Malacca intending to attempt the conversion of China, leaving other missionaries in Japan. And the missionaries in Japan are important because they were the first people who actually sent back to Europe <coughs> any kind of reports about Korea. And of course, uh, then uh, Francis Xavier left Malacca for, for China, never really got there, arrived on that island, got some kind of disease and died. But Japan, of course, is this famous story that within a few years, 
that Japan had something like 300,000 Christian Catholics. Uh, there was an enormous uh, wave of conversions, very mysterious. And um, that included, of course, Koreans. There were Koreans living, trading in Japan, or prisoners in Japan, or shipwrecked. And there were even, we think, Korean parishes in Japan. And we know from letters sent back to Europe that Francis Xavier met Koreans. Uh, envoys have been dispatched to Japan in 1550-1551, and these annual letters contain accounts, little mentions, no great long stories, and of course nobody went from Japan to Korea to follow up until the uh, 1592 Indian War. And among the Japanese troops, there were almost certainly some Portuguese mercenaries fighting on the side of the Japanese. And of course, the famous uh, <coughs> Jesuit priest, uh, Gregory Cespedes, who came as a kind of uh, chaplain to the uh, Christians in the Japanese army. And we know he celebrated Mass and stayed in Korea on Korean ground uh, for uh, some time, 18 months. But he did not really, as far as we know, send back much information and probably did not in fact, meet uh, ordinary Koreans who are on the other side of the battles. So, of course, uh, the Portuguese explorers depended for navigation on these roteiros, also called Porto Lands maps, which are designed to show coastal routes. So, if you look very closely, you see that, in fact, all along the coast, there's a constant sort of listing of the names of the places so that you could navigate to sort of land. Where are we? And you look for the name on your map. There's nothing else, nothing inland at all. Only rivers coming out and uh, place names and also that you can use these maps uh, with your compass to uh, navigate your way around. Uh, but they couldn't resist making them look nice and selling them slowly, a kind of commerce trade report grew up, uh, selling maps to richer people uh, for armchair exploration. People who were not going to travel, who did not need them for that. So this map is almost certainly uh, the first map to uh, show you uh, where Korea is. I don't know how to use this thing. Do I? Yes, here we are. Uh, if you look closely, it is actually drawn as a kind of collection of islands, uh, an archipelago as Japan is, uh, which is interesting. But this is probably the first map ever to show, Western map, Western map, ever to show you uh, the shape, something like the shape of Korean Peninsula. But it's not named on this map. So this map is from 1554, so that's pretty early. But the Jesuits were already there. Uh, this is then uh, much later, 1594, and um, by this time, uh, Korea is out here, but he's not quite sure if it's attached to the mainland or if it's an island. And then you have Japan and China. It's sort of ambiguous. They had an idea it was an island, maybe because the Portuguese were all the time talking about Japanese islands and mentioning Korea in that context. Later, then, the son of the man who made that previous map, his chart in 1630, uh, shows Korea clearly as a peninsula. Uh, but that's still quite unusual, actually. And again, uh, this map. You see, you have all the place names all along the coasts, but then nothing inland at all, except the Great Wall, which you can see from space, <coughs> or not. Actually, in the earlier 17th century, mostly, then, you have this, this map is designed to bewilder you. Uh, you have to realize the south is here, north is here. West is here, East is here. This is Japan, and this is uh, Korea Insula, the island of Korea. <laughs> Shigula, as you can see, I'll tell you what it is. 
So these were the first real sort of information people were getting in Europe. Uh, these maps are, especially this Jocundus Hondius, is the man who took over from Mer famous Mercator. Mercator uh, drew maps, started to prepare an atlas, but he died before he could really finish his job, especially for these distant countries. And here we are, uh, then, adding to them. But the other country that was very good at sailing, uh, that was uh, the Dutch, Holland, and uh, they came, as it were, on the, in the footsteps of the Portuguese, as that bit later. <coughs> and the first Dutchman, uh, this is more historic than almost, and anyway, we know that probably the first Dutchman to visit China and Japan on Portuguese ships was Dirk Pomp, or Dirk Gerritz. Pomp, also called Dirk China. And in 1569, then, he came from via Portugal as a merchant doing business uh, in Goa, in India. And from there he sailed to China and Japan at least twice. And he arrived in Japan for, on a second visit, 1585, returned to Netherlands in 1590. And he wrote one of the very first extensive accounts of China, uh, and that was published in Holland. Dutch were also very interested in business. But of course, the Dutch were Protestant, whereas the Portuguese were Catholic. And there was real sort of pretty much war. This 1588 was the time of the Armada in England, and it was all very tense. So, 1588, 1589, uh, Pope then sailed from Goa back to Europe. And on that ship was another man, was this Dan Huberman in Chilton, and probably Pomp had heard in Japan about Korea. And probably he told this friend of his, they're from the same town, about uh, Korea. Because then, uh, on an autumn, he spent about five years in Goa, 83, 88, and he was secretary to the Portuguese Archbishop of Goa. And he was still young, he's only in his early 20s, he seems to have had a hobby, and his hobby was what we would call commercial espionage. <laughs> uh, he spent most of his free time copying these Portuguese charts and navigation aids. Not sure if he knew what he was doing or if it was just interesting, because he couldn't sail beyond Goa. Uh, so um, he had huge collections, 60, 60 different uh, navigation guides to all the different areas beyond Goa where the Portuguese were doing business. And he then went back to the Netherlands, so they on the same boat as Paul, and uh, published uh, these portraits, sorteros, in Dutch. Wow! Telling them the Dutch navigators how to get there. It was widely translated to This was really, this book, um, Itinerario in short type, by a very long type language. All of that is titled. They like long titles. The title tells you everything. It's like TOC. Yeah. And uh, it was, for example, it was translated very quickly uh, into English. Uh, his discourse of voyages into the East and West Indies divided into four books. Uh, and actually, this book was published with the encouragement of a very important person in England, Richard Hacker. And he was the first great collector of travel stories and publisher of them. And Ian Chilton had something to say about Korea. This is pretty much the first actual text about Korea. There are some mentions in Jesuit letters scattered about, if you read them in Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, Latin, not, I think not in English, in French. These islands, and the Portuguese are called As Ilas de Corre, but the great island Corre is called Chosen. On the northwest side it has a small creek where there lies an island which is a haven, very deep. There is the Lord there, the Lord of the country has his palace, continually resident. This instruction I had from a nobleman of Portugal called Pedro Acuna. 
that have seen him travel through all the country. Are you? <laughs> having by him all that by certain purpose, being great experience, having arrived, stayed in the country for say by tempest and stormy weather. Ah, shipwreck. But he doesn't have a very clear notion from our point of view of the country. But in the book, there's a map. It's quite interesting because this is Korea. <laughs> That's Japan. Looks like a fleet. This is Korea, totally an island with a creek. And I say he didn't really know very much. So, then there's this beautiful story, 1600, the first arrival of a Dutch ship in Japan. And it's a striking story. Uh, actually, we have that Mr. Pomp, uh, Dirk Pomp, uh, Dirk China, back and forth. He, uh, after he went back to the Netherlands, he was got bored. So there was an expedition set up. Five Dutch ships were going to sail around South America, up through the Pacific, to the Spice Islands, Indonesia, Malaysia, get, fill themselves up with spices, carry them back and make a fortune. And um, actually, four of those ships failed. One sailed back, didn't get through Straits of Magellan. Uh, the Pomp Pomp's ship uh, was captured by the Spanish in Chile, and uh, then he caught a ship back, but disappeared during the journey. Anyway, the last of the ships, Dutch ships, reached Japan. They went. They had an alternative for that plan, Japan. And in April 1600, 19 months at sea, this leaved them, with about 20 sick and dying men out of 100 who had sailed, arrived the island of Kyushu. And they made landfall of Bungo, and among the survivors, actually, the pilot was an Englishman, William Adams. And he asked the daimyo of Edo, and the Hiroshima Shoko, took a very strong liking to Adams, who was obviously very good at languages, he learned Japanese quickly. And Adams ended up, after a few years, as a samurai, uh, with an official Japanese title, house, wife, and a really deeply trusted advisor of uh, this um, Tokugawa Hiyashu. And his Japanese name was Miura Anjin, the pilot of Miura. And after a few years, he realized that he had influence, and the Japanese were fed up with the Portuguese. They wanted an alternative. The, Japanese, the Portuguese were not very really <coughs> helpful to themselves, with a bad reputation. So it was Adams, actually, who persuaded the Japanese to uh, give trading permission for the English and for the Dutch. The English made a mess of it, but the Dutch did not. And Adams then uh, died. If you, if you read that uh, novel called Chopin, uh, the novel by Clavel called Chopin is based on this true story. And this actually is the document which Adams got for the Dutch, dated 1609. It says, Dutch ships are allowed to travel to Japan, and they can disembark on any coast without reserve. This regulation must be observed. The Dutch are free to sail where they want throughout Japan. For the next 200 years, most of the Dutch had really to live in Nagasaki. But they could trade. Now, they were the only people who would trade. That was this document which uh, made it possible. And of course, it was because the Dutch were trading with Japan that, in the 17th century, Hano uh, got shipwrecked uh, in Tijuana. So we come back to Richard Hacklert. I said he was collector of travel accounts. And in 1598, he produced the first of uh, three, four volumes, three volumes of Principal Navigations, which is one of the big, big landmarks of travel literature. He has collected stuff and translated it, or had it translated, from all sorts of languages. For example, he knew that Jesuit missionaries had been providing Europe with information about Japan, some about China, some about Korea in their annual letters, and especially Freus, a very important uh, missionary in Japan, and that there were mentions of Korea all the way through. So, uh, Hacklett in volume 3 
uh, provided extracts from the letters collecting together information about Korea, mainly from being from the Japanese side, mainly about the Indian War. Three several testimonies concerning the mighty kingdom of Korai. Spelled with a C, like everybody else. Korai. There you are. So, concerning the mighty kingdom of Korai, tributaries, the king of China, for their politics, bordering upon his northeast frontiers, called by the Portuguese Korea, and by then esteemed as at the first an island since found to join the mainland. Not many days' journey from Peking, that many metropolitan city of China. And the more perfect discovery whereof, the coast of Tartai, the north of Maine, time being great light, if not full certainty, of a north of the Portuguese <coughs> passage. They're wondering how to get back to Europe quicker. They thought maybe they could say that. And a lot of what's printed there is about the Indian War and what the Japanese did to Koreans. Uh, but there is a little description. The Kingdom of Korea extends in length, hundred of leagues in breadth, sixty leagues. Inhabitants in nation, language, and strength of body be different from China. Chinese, Chinians, Chinese. Yeah. Uh, they pay tribute, exercise traffic with the subjects. They imitate laws, apparel, customs, and government of the Chinians. And they border on the Tartars. That's uh, Manchuria. Other nations. Well, sometimes they have peace, sometimes war. Chinians, they have continual peace. Okay, so Pinto. Uh, Pinto comes here because his book, uh, which uh, is extraordinarily totally unknown, and you will see why, I and mean, it's big stuff. It's heavy. Uh, he was probably at least one of the first Europeans to reach Japan. And he says he was there when the archivist was given. Uh, to the Japanese coming Shima, and he heard, almost certainly he did, because it's very lively, it describes Francis Xavier debating with the Japanese monks, Buddhist monks. And then he went back home, and he arrived back home, he was lucky, and wrote this book, a huge book, which he did not publish, because it is intensely subversive. Uh, well, he's seen, it's a bit like Utopia. He seems to be praising the wonderful Portuguese, the wonderful Portuguese massacres, the wonderful Portuguese robbers, the wonderful Portuguese uh, cheating, deceiving, uh, making money, enslaving people. And then from time to time, he introduces these crude, ignorant barbarians who are kind, merciful, helpful, and so on. He's Definitely uh, not uh, in favor of Portugal. But nobody noticed it. Uh, after he died, then, 30 years later, the book published, became very popular in Portugal and in Spain. Then, during the Commonwealth of England, kind of extracts were published, but nobody really noticed a bit too late, and it was difficult to read because <coughs> this was Commonwealth, very Protestant, so no mention of Francis Xavier, they are to follow. They are. So, after this, then, the Jesuits, now we move, of course, because the Jesuits and the Christians in Japan, they lost everything. And the Christians were massacred, the missionaries were expelled. So everything that comes later comes through China about Korea. It was basically the Jesuits in China who then uh, took over as source of information. And the first of them was Martino Martini, <coughs> now we're into the 17th century. Uh, Japan's closed. And Martin <coughs> wrote a text which would have been interesting, but it was only published in Dutch, which is not very helpful. Uh, but he did allow the Dutch uh, mapmakers to improve somewhat their idea of Korea, a little bit, not much really, because, as you see, there is in fact no information. No names, no names at all. Nothing, nothing. As in Japan, you really have a lot of information there about uh, sort of administrative divisions and towns and deaths. Very different. Korea is still basically unknown, but at least they have the shape of the coast more or less. And something that presumably is Chichigo, it's in the wrong place. And also then, in his book, 
used in Dutch as a, a, a summary of ancient Korean history. Not very really long. And he's not always very uh, well informed. Uh, a little bit. This is still more than we had before. The whole hanging island, that's peninsula, Korea, is divided into eight counties. The one lying in the middle is called Kinki County. In which, I suppose it's it shouldn't be, but it looks like it. Then he says, in which the noble city of Pyongyang is, where the kings keep their court lie, yeah? And so it goes on. Names and, uh, again, confusion. The western county is called Huangche and was before called Chaosek. Oh, yeah. So, and he doesn't really know anything. Cities are built in Chinese way, strengthened, I say they all have walls. One finds here the same clothing, language, and way of writing as the Chinese, or oh, yeah, language. Same religions and church, as to say, of course, uh, Buddhism. Church doctrine is the one who teaches the moving of the souls, reincarnation, and so on. So you have something. They give space to fruits and wheat, fruit which we find in Europe. Mainly pears are pears of a good taste. And one part of Korea makes several kinds of paper. Pencils of audacity, pens, uh, brushes, writing brushes. So, of course, uh, the first actual account, first hand, from extended residence in Korea is the account of Hamel. If you want to read Hamel, there are copies at the back published by RAS. Um, so he was one of the crew members of this Dutch ship, Spareware, and he lived in Korea then from 1653 until 66. Finally they were able to escape because the Koreans said, you're here, you stay. And they helped the Koreans, they helped the Koreans improve <coughs> their military strategy and things. Finally, however, they were able to escape back to Japan and so back to uh, Holland, and he wrote an account of his adventures that was published in Rotterdam, 1668, in Dutch, and that was translated into French, and that was very important, and then this, actually it was short French, and the Frenchman didn't really know Dutch, so it's not a very reliable translation, <laughs> and the French was then translated into English, by this time we're getting into the habit and fashion of travel stories, so it was published in a collection of voyages and travels as an account of the shipwreck of the Dutch vessel on the island of Kempart. Nobody knows why Chichville got to be called Kempart. Kempart is the name of the Dutch kind of ship. But Hamel already calls it Kempart. <coughs> and this is, uh, in Holland they still have what Hamel wrote. This is the manuscript uh, of Hamel's account. Our edition there at the back is translated from what Hamel wrote, not from the published editions. And this is the English one. And, well, of course, he was there for years and years. He had a lot to see. He wasn't an intellectual, and you can tell that. So one part of the book is their experiences, and they had a hard time, really hard time. He wasn't happy. And on the other hand, everything he could remember about what people had told him about Korea all the different categories of stuff. But he doesn't do lists. Right? He, you, he's not completely, <coughs> uh, he's not really a scholar. Thing, but, uh, he doesn't give you a full list of everything, or place names, or distances, or that. It's much more impressionistic. <coughs> makes it more interesting, of course. And it's very general. Um, he mentioned Seoul and Busan, but I say not necessarily all the other <coughs> cities and provinces. And, again, general information uh, about the shape of it. It's long, square, like a playing card. Uh -huh. And some sort of points. And eight provinces, 350 cities, ports, castles. And he dwells at length on the very cruel punishments that the Korean justice system hands out. Also about religion, about the rituals connected with death and so on. And actually, more interesting, uh, in some ways, 
There was a Nicholas Hitson, who was a very famous scholar in Holland, and he published a book which included an account by one of Hamill's companions, that is, Ibokken. And Ibokken, who was very bright, who was written in more of an intellectual, he had memorized better Korean language, and he gave to uh, Hitson a list of the words he could remember. And it's clear, if you look at the spelling of the words, that he remembered them as written in Hangul. Uh, so you have here in a Handel Hangul. He, Tal, Pyon, Tala, Nam, Bok, Sio, Dong, Mul. Written in Dutch style. But um, that's the book. And that's, in the book, part of, of the list of uh, Korean words. So it's the first list of Korean words that you've got published. And uh, Bob Hitson's book was never read, never translated, so nobody really noticed it until 30 years ago or something. Uh, but it's a pity because Hamill, I said, Hamill's book then got mangled. Uh, the most famous mangling occurs in this description in the French, which is then translated into the English. Um, we mm. never saw any elephants there in Korea. Alligators or crocodiles of several sizes. Keep in the rivers. There's this whole paragraph about the Korean crocodiles. <laughs> and uh, they eat fish or flesh, are great lovers of men's flesh. Mm. The Koreans often told us that three children were once found in the belly of one of these crocodiles. Where did he get it from? It's not in the Dutch. Anyway, but of course, Hamel's shipwreck was the result of a trade conducted by the Dutch uh, with Japan. And um, in China, of course, the Catholic missionaries, they were controlled. A few of them, the really intellectual, talented ones, came to China with a very special position as geographers or geometers, mathematicians or astronomers of the emperor. They had an official court title, and they were very talented men. And so Martini was the first one, and one of their tasks, they felt, was to make accurate maps of China. <coughs> And then 1687, French Jesuits were sent, and they were even better. They had new modern instruments for measuring you know, things about latitude and longitude and stars and sun. And they were really interested in map making geography. They were trained uh, in astronomy, and so, especially Jean Baptiste Regis, an extraordinary man, very, very talented. And they were great friends of the emperor, who by this time, of course, was from Manchuria, Manchu. And they used to go on hunting expeditions with the emperor, these Jesuits, up in or near Manchuria. And they were fully protected. So uh, in early 18th century, 1709, 1710, uh, they surveyed, thanks to the emperor with protection, all that area to the north of Korea, and Regis got as far as the, the frontier, and he could look across. He probably could not even step on Korea. At least you can see it. And then they sent back all their accounts. And their accounts then, of China mainly, of course, uh, were uh, published in French by Duhalde, Jean-Baptiste Duhalde, who never left Paris. He had, if you like, the easy job, collected, editing everything he sent. And the result was this huge four volume anthology of the records of China. Description, géographique, historique, chronologique, politique, visible, l'empire, la Chine, la tap tap et chinoise, des cartes, etc. And Tibet, Corée, and with pictures as well. Big thing. And there, uh, you have an English edition very quickly, good English edition, General History of China. This is really getting serious. Now, these are big, expensive books, really scholarly, uh, in-depth studies, lots of information. Uh, so this is 1739, and Korea described volume 4. And, in fact, Regis, very frustrated, they couldn't go into Korea, 
uh, there was this Tartar, this Manchu lord, who was trusted by the emperor, uh, and he offered to go into Korea. He made a visit to Seoul, probably to Seoul with uh, a Chinese surveyor, also trained by the Jesuits, and they were allowed to produce a map partly from their observations and partly from copying, although the Koreans were very protective of any information getting out. They didn't really like it at all. But anyway, they produced a map of China based on this uh, Manchurian uh, expedition into uh, Korea. And this is uh, the resulting map as it was published. And of course, it does look much better. I mean, there are place names. You have to get up very, very close to see them. And uh, pretty much, pretty much the shape. But of course, they had not been in. They had not really got information on the exact location or area, including the coastline. And there is a lengthy account of Korea in Duhat. But of course, they haven't been there. They haven't seen it. So all you can say, really says, what I saw on the frontiers it's very well cultivated, yeah. uh, and the Lord gave an account, country's good, produces whatever is necessary, rice, corn, millet, grain, and he brought this map back, but he only got to the court, so he can only tell us how far it was to the court, uh, and so on. And so, geographical observations, a bit limited in the information, there's some, it's interesting, it's worth reading. And uh, so then, because Regis is brilliant at classical Chinese, he can read Chinese better than French or Latin, or at least as well. So he takes what he finds in Chinese books and uh, translates, summarizes it. This account of Korea is taken out of three different authors. Uh, so three Chinese books, sort of, and encyclopedias which mentioned Korea, he gets the information then from China. I have contented myself with a bare translation and added a chronology which is looked upon as unquestionable. Oh yeah, well, better than nothing. So again, it's there, first in French and also in English. It's all in the English edition. You can read it from my homepage. So there you have the earlier 18th century. What you have are two accounts. What Regius gives you, which is mostly sort of rather archaic Chinese historical information, and Hamel's account of daily life as he saw it during his years in Korea. And that was it. Throughout the 18th century, that was all you had. So you had to stir it up a bit. Again, you have maps uh, here. Uh, you have two maps. And this is Korea in one. This is Korean. Yeah, you can see it's basically okay, but actually, of course, if you are sailing a ship, um, you need to be careful because there is no real serious uh, information about where this coast actually is. <coughs> and so you get this history, you get inside the region, the 18th century, full of people reading big books. And multiple books, 40, 30 volumes in encyclopedia history of China and so on. Um, but none of them had any information. But as you get toward the end of the 18th century, something changes. You start now to have uh, official naval surveys. In England, most famous one is Captain Cook. You are discovering, not so much discovering as surveying, identifying, locating, and then making very precise navigation charts of coastlines that well, Captain Cook was down in Australia. But uh, the French naval officer, one of the very great French naval officers, big name, Jean-François de la Hutte Comte La Pérouse, not quite sure how real that title is. Anyway, he sailed this way on this huge journey uh, which uh, took him uh, for us, then, from Manila via Taiwan, past Japan, up <coughs> there to uh, Sakhalin or so, and then uh, down from there, he would sail to Australia, called in at Australia, uh, sent back some postcards, 
arms and sail off and disappear. Then years later, centuries later, uh, the shipwreck was dis discovered. Uh, we know where he was shipwrecked uh, in the storm, presumably. Uh, but luckily, uh, he had uh, sent back lots and lots of documents, uh, document documents and information and log books and charts uh, as he was going, including after he had sailed past uh, Chicago. Uh, he went, <coughs> so he did observe and survey the southern coastline of Chichido, he did not land. He was afraid that they would arrest him by camel, he'd never get away. Uh, so then they sailed up the coast, uh, they were driven, I think, by a storm, and they saw this island, uh, which we now call Ulundo. And the person on the ship uh, who first saw the island uh, was um, the um, astronomer of the journey, and the surveyor astronomer, whose name was Dajele. And that's why if you look at old accounts of Korea, you find them using the name Dajele or Dagalet for Ulundo, because that's how that, that area was named. It. These European explorers always gave names of European people to places. Anyway, so he his book was published ten years after he disappeared, translated, and here actually uh, there is the trace of his journey, the, the dates uh, for each day of his journey. So here I Ulong no Kashi there, and then down Seoul, Japan, and then right up here, and then back and down to Australia, uh, at the Woods. And then 1797, British explorer this time, uh, William Brown, and the description of his journey then published. And people are now into publishing in a big way. This is uh, part of the, the way things are. You explore, you make a report to the government, but then you make some money, if you're lucky, uh, by publishing. And uh, Brown actually includes, he, as he was passing Korea, they were short of water and firewood for cooking. So they called him at Busan. They were not welcome. Nobody was welcome. Um, so in the end, they, they did manage to get firewood and water. And they, you know, people understood they needed these things, but at the same time, oh. So it's observed how little opportunity we had to make any remarks on the customs of these people. But this picture, this drawing, is actually a drawing of what you could see of Busan Harbor from their ship. I mean, it doesn't give you much information. It's one of the first actual drawings from life of a Korean landscape that they got, I think. Uh, so they didn't <coughs> understand really why the Koreans were so unfriendly, unwelcoming. And you didn't realize, of course, Koreans sent a report of their passage up to Seoul and it is in fact included in Chosun Kwan Jo Shilo, and uh, Henry uh, Savanija translated that, or had, uh, uh, and puts it in his pages, about the Korean version of this visit. So you have both their account and the Korean account. A ship from a strange country arrived off in Dongne. Fifty people, all of them had their hair tied or pulled back, pigtails. They wore hats made of thick white material, shaped looked just like our warrior hat, dressed in thick black material, thin trousers, high nosed, blue eyed. They neither knew nor understood Chinese, Japanese, or Mongolian. Gave them brushes to write, writing resembled mountains, covered with clouds. <laughs> Pictures were drawn, we still could not understand. And then, uh, it's the 19th century, 1816, Lord Amherst went to China, he's going to complain to the emperor, scold the emperor, no way, and said, if you're going to meet the emperor, you will have to make a deep kowtow. No, no, no. no. So, okay, then you don't meet the emperor. So he never met the emperor, but he sent his ships, two of his ships at least, to survey the coast of Korea. And one of them was commanded by Basil Hall, and actually this surveying expedition, both in China and in Korea, produced no less than four books. Actually, then the Alcest struck a rock later, and all the botanical and geological specimens were lost. There was one guy, a very nice guy, 
uh, this Clark Abel. Uh, uh, he is a wonderful naturalist, for instance, so he had thousands of specimens. Then, as the ship was very slowly sinking and burning, uh, one of the seamen took his, his trunk of specimens, emptied it out, and filled it up with one of the high class men's shirts. <laughs> Linen, yeah, more important. So you've got all these books. Basil Hall, most interesting, and then it was reprinted, his, his account of their visit to various islands off the, off Mokpo, basically off Mokpo, uh, these are all four islands, very touching, uh, very funny. They couldn't communicate at all, they had no interpreter, stupid. No interpreter, so the officers are struggling to communicate with the mandarins. They look over the side. The ordinary sailors and the servants of the mandarins, they're having a fine time. They're smoking, they're drinking, they're laughing. No problem. Uh, so, this, these books, I think, are the first books illustrated with drawings of Koreans. I'm not quite sure, I'm going to get it wrong. But, and McCall uh, Falls actually has one drawing. They're always fascinated by the mandarins with their hats. They couldn't really believe in these hats. And most important, for the first time you got accurate coastal survey because uh, as Paul says, we were sailing and we were sailing according to the maps we had. We were in the middle of Korea and we couldn't, still couldn't see anything. And this Charles Goodslaff who arrived trying to bring the Bible and Christianity to Korea, uh, uh, riding on a sort of merchant <coughs> uh, ship. It's already the beginning of you know, trying to force entry. And he reports that he planted potatoes. And I'm not quite sure if in fact these are the first potatoes in Korea or not. But anyway, he reports that he planted uh, potatoes. Uh, another important account comes from Japan. There's this German uh, ethnologist, whatever you call him, uh, von Siebold, who lived in Japan, and he again collected an enormous amount of information about flora and fauna. But near Nagasaki, or just in Nagasaki, there was a place for Koreans <coughs> who were shipwrecked. And he used to like to go there. He was interested in these different people. You see, the Koreans were different. Japan. And of course in those days Koreans on their ships they had their wives and children as well and they often had to spend months waiting to be repatriated back through Tsushima. Uh, and this, he, again you have some drawings of uh, Koreans in the, his book and here we are, um, potatoes from Quizlet. And another survey, Belcher, again uh, and in Belcher's book, Volume 2, there's a natural historian who's allowed to give an extraordinary account of the nature he saw. He, he knows he's a scientist, but he's, he loves poetry. He quotes Edmund Spencer quite a lot. And here is his take on Chichibo. Gaudily tinted butterflies sport around, feathered warblers twitter in the trees, crowds of insects spin about flowers, among the birds was in the modest pigeon cowering in some deep recess. Flycatcher, butcher bird, is the intent on prey. Showy woodpecker fluttering in its pride, clinging to the boughs in every kind of fantastic attitude. Um, uh, very poetic, most poetic description so far, for real. Nothing about people, but <laughs> birds. <laughs> modest birds. Ducks, diver, divers, disporting themselves in the way. Actually, there's another guy on the same ship, Frank Marriott, whose father's famous, actually, uh, sort of novelist, popular novelist. He published a volume of drawings, but he didn't really find much to draw. He didn't have much time to draw in Korea. So he only gave you these two drawings of people in Crow Park. This is where you go at that time. It's the Mandarin. They had a hard time. They couldn't communicate. And again, in Belcher's book, Again, you have a list of vocabulary, and the vocabulary actually provided by a missionary uh, in China. So, again, nobody really paid any attention. Here you are. You have six Filipino languages, as well as various other languages, and over right here uh, on the far side. Korea, mostly taken from an edition of the Thousand Letter Classic, which 
Chinese person. Then, of course, you're coming close to the opening where people are forcing the opening. Uh, first of all, uh, Commander Perry opening Japan, and then China in terrible trouble, uh, the Opium War, and then the Taiping uprising, millions, millions of people dying. And business becomes more and more important. And then gunboat diplomacy. Gunboat diplomacy, first of all, the French, 1866, after the killing of the missionaries, the Catholic missionaries. And then after that, in 1871, the United States suddenly uh, doing something in response to the uh, killing of the people of the General Sherman <coughs> in Pyongyang. And they both focused on Kanwa. They couldn't really communicate at all with the government. And so people of Kanwa had a hard time. But the French expedition, there's an account of what the French expedition was like by somebody who was on it. Uh, Jean-Henri Joubert, who was an artist, and his account, which is published some years later, uh, actually does not really mention the fighting and the killing. He's not too. And actually, he loved, he loved Canada. And after the fighting was over, people were going on farming and harvesting. So his account, he's an artist, he brought back watercolors, which were then uh, turned into engravings for the, uh, this Tour Monde, this magazine. And this is Zubel's take on Korea. He was very amused by these rain hats. These are hats which the Koreans kept in their pockets except when it rained, he says. And he thought it was very brilliant. He thought it was wonderful, much better than Nagra. I said he really did like Korea. And uh, took pictures, as it were, or drew pictures of people uh, in their natural environment. This is Kanwado, uh, the government office in Kanwado, it says. I thought they burnt it. So very uh, idyllic. And it was in his article, he says, as they were exploring the, the government enclave in Kanwado, uh, uh, buildings, they discovered lots and lots of weapons, and we found many books and loops by paper. And most of the books, some of which are adorned with remarkable paintings, are now in the National Library in Paris. He wrote in 1872. A hundred years later, a Korean discovered. <laughs> well, good. But of course, people had forgotten, and they were not properly cataloged. They were also written in Chinese characters, so people think that's when I thought they were Chinese. They were the Uyghur. And so, I wonder, Zuber was an artist, and he says, wonderful, wonderful, remarkable paintings. Was he the person who said, you've got to take these books back. Don't burn them. Put them on the boat. And then the first book ever to contain a really extensive account of Korea was uh, Charles Dallet, Histoire de l'Église de Vauche, written in French, the story basically of all the persecutions of the Catholics in Korea. But at the beginning, he has 200 pages about Korea, taken from letters written by the French missionaries since uh, they first arrived in the 1830s. Uh, so it's 200 pages of information about Korea. That's a lot of information. Um, one last person, Olpert, notorious Mr. Olpert, is strange, who met one of the surviving French priests, Father Hill, uh, in China, and Hill, and he cooked up a plan, uh, which basically was to uh, <coughs> kidnap the body of the Taewon Boon's father and hold it to ransom, force the Taewon Boon to uh, open up Korea for trade. Um, so they had an expedition, they arrived there, and he describes it, but in his book, he never says that they were aiming to kidnap a corpse. <laughs> he never says they were going to dig into a grave. It was some 
especially venerable relics in a specially protected place. Far away. No mention. All right, but this is where they got to. You can't mistake it for anything but a grave. <laughs> anyway, so, and that book by Obert, he then went back to Europe, it's a very strange book because uh, it is a rather scholarly again, introduction to Korea, pretty much the first one published in German and in English, uh, certainly self justifying as well. That's the first account, that's 1880. Two years later, you have the Schuchert Treaties and Korea opens. Thank you very much. Uh, I think a brother Anthony can entertain a few questions. I don't know the answers. <laughs> no questions? Questions. Okay. One of the first people, the priest, he described as Flemish, but the Latin said Dali, which would be French. At the beginning, there was uh, someone who was... William, William Roebuck. Right. William Roebuck was from what we would call, he was Flemish in origin, but he was serving Louis the Ninth, who was French. Okay, because he described himself as French in the Latin part. Yeah. <laughs> but he was originally French. Okay. He was a servant of the King of Okay. Okay. 